following is presented by CrewRoundTable.com Podcast Network. What is the point of putting someone in jail? Douglas Garland killed three people in one of the most high-profile murder cases in the history of the province of Alberta. While waiting for his sentencing, he was assaulted by four inmates in a Calgary jail. When this news was released to the public, keyboard warriors across the nation took to the comment section and screamed, more of the same, good riddance to bad rubbish, and it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Douglas Garland's lawyers believe that all those commenters are wrong. They believe that it was an injustice that happened to Douglas Garland. What do you think? Welcome to Hot Takes with Gino, an informal discussion of topics affecting those living in the greater Toronto area. For more information, visit crewroundtable.com. Welcome back once again to the latest and greatest episode of Hot Takes with Gino, proudly presented by the Crew Roundtable Podcast Network. Please head over to crewroundtable.com where you can subscribe to this show and the flagship Crew Roundtable. Please subscribe, rate, share, and review wherever you get your podcasts. For today, we are going to be discussing a triple murder case that took place in Alberta. Now, normally on this show, we try to focus on issues that take place in and around the greater Toronto area, but this show and this particular topic, once we get down to the bones of this topic, I believe that this touches on something deeper than just a general geographic location. I think this speaks to the sensibilities of Canadians. And when you take a good look at it, you may not like where you stand. So I ask everyone to please proceed with caution, because we are going to be discussing some fairly sensitive topics. And with all good topics, you never know where we're going to wind up. So let's get to the information that we have and where it comes from today. The Douglas Garland case took place over four weeks, roughly five weeks, in early 2017. Uh, The articles that we have here today for our background, one from cbc.ca entitled Douglas Garland Remand Assault Charges Late in Court, one from nationalpost.com, defense lawyer blasts those who cheered the prison beating of triple murderer Douglas Garland, Uh, the Calgary Sun, uh, primary source of information, Douglas Garland trial jurors back deliberating fate in triple murder trial, and from globalnews.ca, who is Calgary triple murder suspect Douglas Garland? So who is Douglas Garland, and what did he do? Garland was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 75 years for killing three people. Again, this was in very early 2017, the first few weeks of February. It took jurors eight and a half hours over two days to find Douglas Garland guilty of killing a Calgary couple and their little grandson. And the grandson is where this story takes a turn for the ultimate worst and what many believe leads to the beatings that Douglas Garland is going to receive in jail pretty much for as long as he's in jail from this point on. A three-woman, nine-man jury found Garland guilty of first-degree murder in the June 30th, 2014 slayings of Alvin and Kathy Link... Or, sorry, Alvin and Kathy Licknes. Uh, they are the grandparents and five-year-old Nathan O'Brien. Uh, Nathan was over at his grandparents, Alvin and Kathy's home, for a sleepover. And it could have been worse. There was another child who was supposed to be there as well, uh, but then the other child decided they did not want to spend the night so you can just imagine the tragedy in that family if something like that would have happened as if it's a simple calculus where you can say well one is better than two but imagine having two children killed by this lunatic in the court relatives sat quietly as the jury foreman read in guilty verdicts for the killing and dismemberment of alvin and kathy lickness but when the foreman read the final verdict of first degree murder in the death of the grandson nathan o'brien those in the courtroom gallery could not contain themselves. There were cheers, 
after an emotional five weeks of courtroom drama where everyone in the courtroom had to sit through the grisly details of how Garland killed these people. And they were killed over simply a business deal that went sour, some petty business dispute. The theory that the prosecution put forward, so it wasn't just a simple murder case. Uh, The theory that the prosecution put forward was that all the victims were taken from their home alive and transported in the back of Garland's pickup truck to the Airdrie farm that Garland shared with his parents. And it was at that farm where they were killed. They were likely tortured before they were killed. And after killing these people, the bodies were carved up and burned in a barrel. There was DNA found all over the farm. Uh, There was a child's tooth that was found in a barrel. Some of the grandson's DNA was found in a large meat saw, which also contained DNA from the grandfather. The family, of course, on an emotional roller coaster, they had that outburst when he was found guilty in the courtroom, but the family has to grieve after that. The family will be grieving for decades. Douglas Garland lived with his parents, and police found the following information at the Ardry farm. Internet searches of different ways to kill conducted by Douglas Garland. Information on how to torture and dismember bodies. Photos of dead and dismembered women. Photos of women in restraints and searches, internet searches, for tools for carving up corpses. Douglas Garland was not a misunderstood person. He was not falsely convicted, given the information that we have. Douglas Garland also had a criminal history. Back to 1992, he was producing amphetamines in British Columbia. He has a history of stolen identities and fraud. He has a history of weapon and assault charges. He has served 39 months in federal prison for his past criminal behavior has a history of mental health issues. And this person who was in and out of the justice system for most of his life was paroled at age 40, even though he had a history of violence by the Parole Board of Canada. So that's a little background on who Douglas Garland is, what happened to him in prison while he was awaiting sentencing. So he was convicted, and it seems to be part of the course where you're convicted and then you're sent somewhere where you are held until your sentencing is decided. He was on the hook for, as we mentioned, 75 years for killing three people. His chances of parole, I think the first time he would have been able to come up for parole was when he turned 129 or 130 or something like that. Um, But they do have to do the formal sentencing. While he was in jail, he was assaulted by four inmates. Garland was taken to hospital after being assaulted by these inmates. These inmates that assaulted Garland, again, no angels. Charged with the assault, Brandon Richards, Connor Skipper, Michael Bodan, and 18-year-old Tristan Thorne. And the assault on Garland occurred just hours after he was sentenced for the first-degree murder of those three people, the two senior citizens and the five-year-old grandson. He's, Garland has been released from the hospital. He's back in lockup, but he's under protective custody. And the reason why is because killing the senior citizens, well, you're surrounded by other killers while you're in jail. However, people in jail 
are parents. And anyone who harms children, they have a poor chance of escaping jail without catching a few beatings, if not a fatal beating, from the other inmates. News gets around. For Garland, as I mentioned before, this was one of the most high-profile cases with almost five weeks' worth of testimony in the history of Alberta. So everyone knew who Garland was, everyone knew what Garland did, and everyone knew that he was convicted. These four men in the jail that administered the beating are being hailed as heroes. As I mentioned in the intro, the Canadian public took to the comment sections of news outlets across the country and congratulated these men for giving Garland a beating. And the public wants more. The public sees red on this issue. And they can't be satiated. Can't be sated? Probably sated. The overwhelming majority of the public would hail these four inmates as street justice personified. And they would wish more beatings unto death for Garland. They may get their wish. Garland is back in lockup. It could happen again. Will Garland be in solitary confinement like Paul Bernardo for the rest of his life? 23 hours in a 8 by 8 cell or whatever the dimensions are of his concrete box? Garland has already been in prison for an extended period of time. Would the state put him in general population to be killed? These four avenging angels that administered the beating, they're not angels. Just in case you think that these are good thieves in the night. For example, Skipper was accused of 13 other offenses, including sexual assault, possession of a controlled substance. Richards was charged with eight other crimes, among them assault with a weapon and uttering threats. Bodan convicted of breaking and entering, mischief against property, and possession of a controlled substance, and breaching probation. So these men that administered the beating, they're not angels. Are these the people that we want carrying out vigilante justice when the people of Canada see red and demand more? This led to the reaction from Douglas Garland's lawyers. His defense lawyers condemned the beating of Douglas Garland and the fact that it happened in a Calgary jail. In this jail, we have inmates who are appealing their sentences, so people who are convicted, but we also have people who are awaiting trial. So we have people in the jail who are not convicted, and they're in the general population with the convicted felons. The defense lawyers lamented the comments on social media celebrating Garland's beating. Now, these are the defense lawyers, so you would expect them to say this, but we have to look at the reasoning behind why they are saying this. Yes, they have a bias, but does that take away from their overall position? One of Garland's lawyers stated, convicted or not, he's entitled, so he being Garland, he's entitled to protection and basic human rights, even if he didn't show that to his victims. If there's members of the public who think, yes, that's good, I'm glad this happened, or whatever they may think about it, they are absolutely, totally wrong. It's not what we should ever expect should happen in a Canadian jail. Is that true? Should we expect this to happen in any jail? Forget about, I don't know why he threw in Canadian jail, but should we expect this to happen in any jail? Jails are full of bad people who did bad things. What do we care if they turn on each other? His defense lawyers continued saying that Garland was being held in an area that should have been safe and called the attack disappointing. Noting that Garland had been in custody for over two years awaiting trial without an incident. So remember, the murders happened all the way back in 2014. Garland apparently was the 
was the only ever suspect on the list of suspects. And they were accumulating evidence at an incredible pace. Enough so that they could keep him locked up for two years without a conviction. Now, Garland did not suffer any serious injuries as a result of the beating. But we have to ask, was Garland put in this position on purpose? Why was he left alone with these four prisoners? Why was he not sequestered from the general population? As this is one of the most high-profile murder cases in the history of Alberta involving the death and brutal circumstances of a five-year-old child. These circumstances were in the news for weeks. Everybody knew those who harm children are not treated well in jail by other inmates. And this is a known fact. Douglas Garland would be an obvious target for violence from other inmates. If you were charged with a crime, and not convicted, mind you, just charged, you would not expect to be put into general population. Now, Douglas Garland, with some unique circumstances, was held for over two years where he was safe and nothing happened to him in a jail or a holding center or whatever institutions he was in while he was awaiting his trial. And then upon conviction, he was left alone with these four men in jail at their mercy. We can't help but wonder if there was some sort of ulterior motive or if this was somehow planned by the authorities. And this is what we get when the public seems to condone vigilante-style justice. We must ask, what is the purpose of jail? Is it there to rehabilitate? Or is jail there to impose further punishment along with the loss of certain freedoms? So you're already put in jail. You've already lost certain freedoms. You've lost your freedom of mobility. You've lost some of your privacy. You've, you've lost everything where now you are constantly being watched. You barely even have possessions. You're essentially a ward of the state at this point. Is the jail there to inflict further punishment? Losing those rights is the punishment. But is there some physical component to the punishment that needs to be meted out? Do we, as a society, need our pound of flesh from the convicted felons, even if we are not strong enough as a people to do it ourselves? Do we crave capital punishment and martial law with physical pain in addition to the mental anguish and loss of freedoms one goes through to pay their debt back to society by serving time in jail. What kind of society are we if we rely on the inmates to dole out justice? If we, in effect, condone this behavior, like all those people calling for more blood in the Facebook comment sections, waiting for Garland to get a second round of beatings, and a third, and a fourth, in perpetuity. A very small handful of those commenters, I would argue, and I would place good money, that a very small handful of those commenters, seeing red and calling for blood, would actually raise a fist to Garland's jaw. But they cheer the very bad people who do just that. Well, some people may argue everyone in jail is guilty of something. Let the animals sort themselves out. This is not true. I personally know of a situation where someone was put in jail by the province of Ontario. So let's bring this back to in and around the GTA. Someone was put in jail by the province of Ontario for almost two weeks. In general population. Was threatened with physical violence. Held for almost two weeks with no contact available to friends or family, and this person, to this day, has still not been convicted of a crime. There were charges, yes, and this person was eventually released on bail, but a holding cell should be different from general population in full-on jail. 
and there should be provisions to move people through that system as quickly as possible. If someone is not convicted, the state should not be allowed to hold you for a seemingly indefinite amount of time with no repercussions for the state. So this person, once again, not convicted. But like something out of a Kafka novel, he was picked up, interrogated, thrown in jail, had no idea when or if he was getting out again, taken from his family, taken from his loved ones, almost had hope itself extinguished from him while waiting to find out what was going to happen to him, while waiting to find out what his fate would be if he could make it to the next day, if another inmate allowed him to live to see tomorrow's dawn. The day that we hand over all power to the state with no oversight is the day that we all lose. I'm sure everyone has heard the old saying, you can't fight City Hall. It's true. The state is so incredibly powerful in relation to any one individual, no matter how rich and powerful that individual may think that they are, against the almost limitless resources of the state, everything pales in comparison. The vast majority of the public, of the general public, do not have the means to fight the state. So this person was thrown into a jail in in the greater Toronto area, and they were stuck there for two weeks. And they couldn't say or do anything about it. Any one of you within the sound of my voice could be taken from your home in 2017. Think about this. You could be taken from your home in 2017 and kept by the state for an indefinite but substantial period of time without a conviction and put into general population with convicted felons. And then you deal with all the fallout from being in jail. You deal with your employer. You deal with your family. If you get out and you don't catch a beating, well, no harm, no foul. You can't sue the state for anything. Is that right? You must have done something bad because you're in jail, right? This is insane. Jail is supposed to be for rehabilitation. You lose your rights to privacy and freedom, but you don't gain rights to physical beatings and torture. People in jail are already at their lowest, at their weakest, and a society is judged by how they treat the weak in that society. Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. How we treat prisoners shouldn't be in a four-star hotel. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we set these people up and pamper them. But it can't be a death camp either. If the goal of prison is to punish, then break out the medieval torture devices, have the state administer the beatings, and be honest with yourself that you want criminals to suffer without end for breaking the law. If the aim of prison, on the other hand, is to rehabilitate, then we have to pay more attention to the cracks in our prisons where this vigilante-style justice is observed and encouraged by everyone lacking the stones to get their hands bloody and rip off their own pound of flesh. And on that happy note, once again, we come to the end of the latest episode of Hot Takes with Gino. I encourage everyone, please head over to crewroundtable.com where you can subscribe to this and the flagship podcast, Crew Round Table. Please subscribe, rate, share, and review wherever you find your podcasts. Take care of yourselves, everyone. <laughs>